Now, what's important for vascular access is you need to know about the inflow. So the arterial inflow is important because if the arterial inflow is not good enough, and you maybe say saying, yeah, it's always good. No, in the elderly patients see more and more problems with the arterial inflow because of uh, atherosclerotic disease. So the arterial inflow, proximal of the AV and SMO is important. But of course, what's going in the fistula has to go out. So the venous outflows are important. Um, you should be aware that uh, there are no problems in outflow. Then you have to know the vessels distal of the anastomos. We see more and more ischemic problems in the population. Uh, when I was very young, as young as you were, there was no problem with ischemia. And now we see a lot of ischemia in the island space because the, the, the population is totally different from 20, 30 years ago. So you have to know about the, the flow in the vessels distal of the anastomos. Of course, you, you have to have some impression about the arterial variations. There are some variations in anatomy of the, the in particular arteries in the arm. Um, the collateral vessels are very important because if you make a shortcut between artery and vein, you need collateral vessels to your, to your forearm and your hand, otherwise you get ischemia. So the collateral vessels are important, and of course the hand circulation. And we, I will show you uh, more in detail about all these issues. And of course exposure. But tomorrow we will have uh, all these things, of course, in the Kadav course. The, the adagium in vascular excreation is that we need something to propose to the patients with in your mind that this patient will come back to you because the access is not for the whole life. And usually uh, nowadays a patient is probably three, four, five years on a dialysis treatment. And you have to say to this patient, you will come back because you have to maintain, you do have some maintenance of your access, but probably you need another access in, in due time. So then this, I think, important that you start not there, up, but probably down, and then you can go up. So there are a lot of possibilities. If you look at uh, this, this uh, slide, um, that means that uh, the, you uh, can always say to the patient, there's always an opportunity and a chance to make access in your case. And these are all the, the access you can do. Of course, there are some of this that probably some of you never will be do, <laughs> doing the thorax loop and even going to the leg. I'm not going to, to talk about leg access. That's really rare then you should be um, very uh, in a very big trouble if you go from the upper extremity to the leg. But it is some cases, and sometimes you, you stand there and you cannot do anything with the patient, and you have to go, you have to do some very strange things. But this is what you can do. The anatomy is very straightforward. Uh, of course, the, the, the artery runs from mid elbow. Uh, mid axillary fold to mid elbow and usually um, in the normal anatomy it divides some two centimeters below the elbow in um, the ulnar artery and the radial artery and the radial artery is very good accessible and it's also for vascular access important that you can create at the wrist but you can also go for in the forearm because the radial artery is very easily accessible but not the ulnar artery the ulnar artery is very deep down to the to the muscles so the ulnar artery you can only uh, access probably at the at the left of the wrist. Again, you see here the the arterial vessels, and what's important, you see a lot of collateral vessels in the upper arm, and um, people that person the vessels that do endo. Uh, um, and the procedures in that area, sometimes you just can um, obstruct the subclavian artery with a lot of problems because you have a lot of collaterals. It is the same for the elbow. If you close this, sometimes there's no problem because you have a lot of collaterals. And of course, if there's already an AV fistula, there's a very good stimulus to, to develop collaterals. 
This is what you can find, Supreme RT over the, uh, it goes to the first rib and then we call it uh, from the first rib to the axillary, the axillary artery. Uh, and the brevary artery goes from the axillary fold to the elbow piece. So this is the standard anatomy you can see uh, for the arteries in the upper arm. This is the picture in the angiogram. And in this case, there was an, I think, a high bivocation of the radial artery, this is over there, yes. The vessel in the forearm, and tomorrow we will go to the elbow dissection, and then this is very standard that you can find the artery below the lacets fibrosis. The other thing is the, the nerve, and the median nerve should be very careful handled. Uh, don't put a hook. <laughs> behind the median nerve, then you have a problem. Um, so the median nerve is usually a little bit more away from the artery, two, three centimeters. So it is not really a problem, but it can be near to the artery. And this is the angio you can find, straightforward angio. And um, there you can also see another artery. It's coming from the ulnar artery, is the interossi artery. Sometimes it is good collateral if you obstruct your ulnar artery or uh, a bit in the, in the radiocephalic fistula uh, on the other side and obstruction of the ulnar artery. It can be good for collateral to have uh, adequate hand circulation in these cases. The variations, um, this is the common arterial anatomy and sometimes you find a high bifurcation in the axilla. You don't know this on forehand. I can say you for this afternoon Probably in one of you, you're going to find this. Don't be afraid for this, but it is <laughs> a normal variation. One out of five, there's probably two of you will have this. And, uh, but of course, if you do access, you, it's nice to know this on forehand. <laughs> Otherwise, you're looking in the elbow, you can't find it. So, but of course, you do a vessel mapping on forehand, you know this. And of course, it can be also on the uh, mid, mid upper arm. Uh, Collateral vessels see in the shoulder, but importantly, more in the, uh, in the elbow region. Um, so, um, usually, if you uh, create a an, brachiocephalic fistula here or a brachiobasilic, then all the blood is shifted, most of the blood is shifted from the elbow up again, but you have these collaterals to, to, to get flow down. If you have good collaterals, you don't get ischemia. If the collaterals are not good, you can get ischemia. And sometimes you have to make a bypass, and maybe it is tomorrow, Matthias, on the program to make a bypass for ischemia in the upper arm. I think so. Yeah. And the hand, of course. Um, the ulnar arteries, I think, the most important collateral for the hand circulation. Uh, if you put in an, an, or if you create an, an radiocephalic fistula. Again, the superficial arts and the deep palmar arts, they communicate with each other, and these are very good collaterals here. And I think in this case, there were some uh, obstructions in the distal arteries, but uh, the arches are okay. This is usually what most of the people don't do this. In the United States, if you don't do this, you get promised you are not reimbursed for the operation anymore. So in the United States, you have to check all the things and to uh, cover all the, the issues uh, to, to not to have any kind of uh, promise with reimbursement or uh, other things with the patient. So check the hand circulation before and after excreation. And this is what you see as a collateral circulation if you put in a radiocephalic fistula. The Allen test, you know that, of course, it is not very reliable, but you can do that. Of course, you can measure flow. If you look with, uh, with your Doppler probe, you can compress the ulnar artery, look with Doppler probe. You can co compress the ulnar artery, look with your Doppler probe. You can even um, look with the ultrasound to the arches. Uh, but it is for if you see the patient in the first instance on the polyclinics, you can do this. The veins, of course, is probably also very important. The standard 
superficial veins and deep veins, and a lot of communication between superficial and deep. And of course, you know about the endovascular creation of AV fistulas nowadays, the costrum perforated vein, perforating vein in the elbow. But there are on more locations perforating veins in connection between superficial and deep. That's important because if you have an obstruction high up, blood can go through perforating veins to the deep system and can go away without any symptoms. So these are important. Again, the most important system for superficial veins and excretion are this one, the cephalic vein, and of course the basilic vein. And there are a lot of communication in the elbow, and that means you can put a lot of anastomose in the elbow region, but you can use the, the, the cephalic vein over a long distance, and, um, and the basilic vein, of course, also in the forearm, but then you have to usually you have to transpose it, but also in the upper arm. And uh, tomorrow we're going to do a basilic vein transposition. Uh, in, the, on, in the cadaver course, uh, there are some issues you have to uh, be aware of when you're doing a basilic vein transposition. Now, the elbow, you know, there are a lot of communications and as much as possible. So, the superficial veins are in the subcutis, but the artery and the deep veins are a layer deeper. Um, that means you have to open up the uh, lacets fibrosis, but um, the elbow is really uh, suitable for a lot of communications and anastomosis, and also, of course, uh, for endo-AVF. Then the central veins. Um, I'm not sure if you still do open insertion of catheters in the cephalic vein, yeah? in the, the Morlheim screw still, or not? Porticat still. <laughs> uh, yeah, this, okay, it's perfect, it's good. <laughs> but then you have the, to dissect this deltoid. Um, I'm not sure, latissimus probably, I'm not sure. Uh, or pectoralis. And then you have this groove. And then you, this is cephalic vein goes deep and it goes in the subclavian vein. This is really a point of promise because uh, you can have stenosis over there. In a typical break of phallic fistulas, you, you, you catch the nose there. Central veins, important for catheter insertion. Um, um, we used to do subclavian catheter insertion, but uh, we don't do this because of the obstruction problems. Now all goes to the internal jugular. But of course, you can also use the external jugular if the internal jugular is not uh, is obstructed or you can use anymore. So the cephalic arches and can be a important uh, area for uh, brachycephalic fistulas. And this is uh, the central veins uh, going to the cable vein and the right atrium. Exposure tomorrow. What we do tomorrow is um, probably the last uh, workshop is a um, loop in the upper arm, I think so. We're not going to do thorax loops. Eh? No. Loop the upper arm, then we have to dissect the, 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 the vessels here. But of course, you can dissect the whole range of, of uh, triac of the brevo artery. Of course, we're not going to open it up for the whole length. But you can find these kind of things. And again, particularly in the axilla, you have nerves. And nerves and the arteries usually behind the nerves. That's really the problem you can get there. And you should be very careful not to, to, to obstruct or to damage these nerves. This is the cross section. So it's very easy to, to uh, go in there uh, uh, between the, the muscles. Um, you see a lot of structures there, um, the artery, but also a lot of deep veins. Uh, I think it's the brachial uh, basilic vein is there, but also a lot of nerves uh, that can be damaged in this area. Elbow, um, we go to do elbow fistulas tomorrow. And of course, you have to um, dissect the superficial veins in the subcutis, but then you find the lacets fibrosis. This is a very um, tough, tough structure. It's really very tough. You have to, to open it up. You have to, to uh, open it up with your scissor. But be careful not to damage the artery that is 
behind it or even the, the nerve. And this is really uh, totally not done tomorrow, this, this thing. <laughs> this is the nerve. Don't do this because you damage the nerve. Again, this is uh, the, the cross section. So the, the superficial vessels are really in the subcutis. And then you find the artery under the lacertus fibrosis. You have to open this uh, uh, to, to approach the artery. But you see in this cross sectional area that the, 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 the um, vessels are very near to each other. It's very easy to connect these uh, uh, different vessels. You can connect there. Uh, because it's very near to each other and, uh, and easy to connect. You can do this in local anesthesia, outpatient department. We have done this uh, for years in, in a private clinic in Valkenburg, doing on local anesthesia. But the problem was that the patients were so old uh, that uh, at some time we, we thought, maybe it's not a good idea to do, to do this without the anesthesi anesthesiologist and uh, <laughs> any backup if uh, something is going to happen. So we stopped this. But you can do this really uh, probably at home if you have a good, uh, good <laughs> operation theater. But maybe it is nowadays not very well appreciated to do that. And then here again, you have to really uh, recognize the, the subcutus and the superficial uh, structures and the deep uh, layer where the artery and the nerve and the deep veins are. But we can see that tomorrow. Then the forearm radial arteries uh, can be dissected over the whole length. And you see here that uh, the ulnar artery goes down to these mus muscles. Ulnar artery goes there, and there's the interosseal artery. Um, there's also this, this own things that this nerve going down with the radial artery is the, the sen um, sensory branch of the, the, the radial nerve. Um, that should be really not damaged. Again, here you see cross-section. Radar art is very easy to approach. Ulnar art is more deeply. And this is at the wrist. Again, um, the veins are sub in the subcutis. The artery is uh, below a an, uh, an, uh, thin fascia. Uh, you can see it here again. It's all straightforward with this, the nerve that's running in the subcutis and it uh, will innovate your uh, sensibility of your thumb. Don't damage that. <laughs> uh, but it's, it still happens. Then this is the last slide. Um, what you see here, and this is really what we didn't know till probably six, seven, eight years ago, the promo of nerve compression. You have these nerves in the uh, axilla, uh, axilla and the arteries in between or behind the nerves. If you put in the in graft and we had this kind of patient, it was a very straightforward operation. There was a loop uh, graft inserted and this patient had a lot of pain after operation and she refused to have this graft cannulated. And nobody, we didn't, didn't understand this. What was the reason? So it was sent to the neurologist. We did the EMGs, no, no abnormalities. And then at a certain moment, I thought, I'm going to explore it again. And then we saw that this graft, it was a an, an, an very uh, stiff graft, no stretch, compressed the, the, the nerve when it came from the anastomosis to the superficial layers and compress the nerve. And then we put in a short piece of stretchable graft and after that, the, the pain was away. It's totally crazy. And then we noticed that there were more pains with pain <laughs> to, to this problem. And also in the elbow, you can get this. But also if, uh, if you have uh, dilated vessels, dilated arteries, because due to the, to the uh, high flow, you can compress the, the median nerve. And we had probably a series of 20 patients that had these problems. And then you can uh, resect the aneurysm or you can um, free up the, the, the nerve together with the neurosurgeon uh, to relieve the, the symptoms. Are there questions on this? I think you can see it tomorrow. And 
tomorrow we have all the time to to have uh, discussion and questions about anatomy and all the things. Okay, so I think we proceed with Sigi. So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I will talk about ultrasound imaging for the upper extremity vessels. It uh, is a very important investigation to um, to make your decision about creating your uh, your fistula. But what is also very important is um, not only the ultrasound but also your clinical examination and the patient characteristics and those uh, combination that will make um, make you um, uh, will make the, the, the right decision for the, the right fistula. So first, um, something short about the patient's characteristics. Now, if you see your patient in front of you, you have to always um, ask yourself, what kind of patient is this? Is this an old patient? Is this a uh, patient with a short life expectancy? Is it worthwhile to make a fistula with maybe some complications that you have to do a revision or a second operation? Or sometimes maybe it's better to do a graft or a, or a catheter. And also what's important for the patient is this quality of life. When we have some uh, very young patients, they want to maybe do some uh, uh, home dialysis and then you have to um, go for a, a lower arm fistula. And it's also important to take into, into account. Also, you have to be aware of the dominant hand. Um, normally, we also go always to the non-dominant hand, but when the non-dominant hand has no good vessels, you don't have to hesitate. You just go for the dominant hand, but you have to speak this through with your patient why. Cardiovascular risk factors and history is also very important. Also, if the patient has a cabbage in history, especially when the cabbage is going from, is coming from the lima, then maybe it's better to avoid the left hand because otherwise you can get uh, some anger on the, on, on the heart. Very important is our history of a catheter, a central line, a pig catheter, a porta catheter, a pacemaker, or something like that. Go better to the other side because sometimes, of, uh, normally, you'll have um, some central vein occlusions or stenosis, and then it's better to go to the opposite side. In case there are both sides are taken, one as a pacemaker and the other side as a porta cat, for example, then it's sometimes better to do a flivography or a CT thorax to just check how the vessels are. Also very important for patients' characteristics is the cardiac function. People with um, heart or cardiac failure, it's better to go very distally because when you go more too proximally, there's a bigger chance of ischemia, also higher flow, and this could uh, compromise cardiac function. Clinical examination, very important. Um, when you have a patient with you in the, in the outpatient clinic, it's very important that you do for the thorough investigation. It's sometimes very easy if you see the patient on the left side, very nice vessels to see, but it's not always like that. Sometimes if you have very obese patients, it's not easy to see. If you have patients with scars and then and tattoos, then it's very nice to have uh, an ultrasound for your patient. Um, also to know what is the blood pressure? Is there a difference in blood pressure? So it could uh, um, uh, state that there is a, an, an, an arterial inflow problem. What are the pulsations? Do you feel pulsation distally? And uh, as uh, Professor Todua already told, you can do an Allen test, uh, for example, to, to see if there's something uh, happening there. Then, um, it's already known, this is a meta-analysis from 2015 that stated that um, ultrasound mapping before creation um, uh, significantly reduces the immediate failure rate compared to um, selective ultrasound, so we do always routine duplex ultrasound. As you can see here, that um, the, the pool dots ratio um, for immediate failure was an, uh, an advantage in favor for the, um, select, uh, the, the routine uh, ultrasound mapping. And also the midterm adequacy was uh, in, uh, in favor for the, the routine mapping. So it's, you have a lot of advantages. Now, when you see your patient, it's very important that you uh, do a thorough investigation, let the patient come in, be aware that the, the, the room where you do the investigation, it's a, it's a warm room, especially in winter time when patients come from outside, it's cold, you get vasoconstriction, the veins are not so good visible sometimes. Um, always let the patient take out their shirt so you can see if there are any um, collaterals on the chest. We also could, uh, could point out that there is a central uh, problem. You can see if there's a catheter, a scar for a porta cut or something like that. And you let uh, the patient sit in a semi-recumbent position. Uh, we always use a tourniquet. 
um, arms a little bit lowered, and you use a linear probe to do our investigation. Then I always start from distally, I go from the veins, I go all the way from distal up, and then when I'm all the way up, I go from the arterial side and go back downwards. So at the wrist, we check for the cephalic vein. Um, if you have a male patient, I also check sometimes if it is good to have a cephalic vein at the snuff box. And women are normally don't know to in a snuff box fistula. And then you go all the way up from the, the wrist to the elbow. You see there are some um, side branches on the vein. Um, is there a parallel uh, vessel? It's very important to see if you do a, an anastomosis that you take the dominant uh, vessel then. Um, at the elbow, there are a lot of uh, variations. So it's very important to, to, to look in what is the best uh, option to choose. And always keep in mind, if I do this option, what's my next option? We take for the cubital vein, the cephalic vein, the upper arm, and the basilic vein. Also very important to check how depth, what is the depth of my vessel. If it is too deep, you have to take into account that you do a second stage, or sometimes when the vessel is big enough, you can do a single stage procedure to do the, the um, a supercilization procedure as well. Um, and then when you go up, you have to also check for the subclavian vein, if there is a uh, good flow in that um, with, uh, with the respiratory wave. And then when we're up, we go back down, and we take uh, into account the, the subclavian artery. We go downwards to the brachial artery, we check if there is a high bifurcation, yes or no. Then we're doing the, the brachial artery at the elbow, and we check the, the, radiocephal uh, the, cephalic, uh, the, the radial artery and the ulnar artery as well. Also diameters, of course, from the veins and the arteries, and we measure flow in the artery. This is for the veins. So, when we check the veins, as I already said, we do it in transversal sections. We check for the continuity. Is there a side branch or not? Is it one smooth vessel, uh, one uh, outflow vessel? The compressibility, that there's no thrombosis or phlebitis and thrombophlebitis in history. The diameter, at least two millimeter. Um, the depth is already set. Tortuosity could also be a problem sometimes. We have to have a, a good cannulation site. And the length for cannulation should be 10 centimeters. When you have tortuosity and the vessel is growing, you will see that uh, the vessel has more tortuosity because of side branches that in the angle of the vessel will make sharper angles when it's, uh, it's growing. We check for side branches and up to the subclavian vein, we check if there's an inspiratory wave to see that everything goes, uh, goes smoothly. Uh, for the arteries, also transversal sections, we check if there are calcifications, especially in diabetic patients, we have to be aware of that. Could be a problem, especially with maturation. If the vessel is calcified, it's not only normally with the, the, with the fistula that the vein grows, but also the, the arteries to grow with it. And calcified vessels, especially with diabetics, it's sometimes a problem with maturation. What's the inner diameter? Are there anatomical anomalies? It's very important. And the longitudinal sections, we check if it's a three-phasic flow and also do a flow measurement. Now, if we have a, a suspicion of stenosis, what will we see at the place of the stenosis? Um, we will see that there is an increased peak systolic velocity and a spectral widening. So you can see this very clearly on your, uh, on your ultrasound. And distal to the artery, when after the, uh, the so distal from the, the stenosis, we see a, a drop down of the peak systolic velocity and also a sp uh, flattening of the spectral wave. And what are the, the characteristics that we need for our artery? At the wrist, is at least 1.5 to 2. I prefer 2 or a little bit more, so it's better. Peak systolic velocity more than 50. And at the, the, for the veins, at the wrist, two millimeters, at, the, at the, the elbow, a little bit bigger, three millimeters. Also for the central veins, uh, we have to, uh, to, to watch for the, uh, the inspiratory uh, wave that we um, will see if the patient takes a deep breath. You can see that there is a wave coming up, and with the expiration, the wave will drop down. Also very important when you have create your fistula, it's not always um, the job is not done. This post-operative follow-up stay is important, also with duplex ultrasound. So we always do a duplex ultrasound at two weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, six months, and then every six months when the, the, the fistula is not yet in use. Because especially these four, the, those, those first um, six to 12 weeks, you have to see that there's maturation or there's a problem so that you can intervene as soon as possible to correct the problem. Um, for non-maturation, 
we look after all, what is the diameter of the vein, the artery, how is the flow, what's the anastomosis, uh, and also the configuration, you have to see what the depth is and how long your cannulation um, will be. So in conclusion, clinical assessment and duplex ultrasound are both very important. Um, it's operator dependent, and I have to tell, when I was first doing the ultrasound myself in our vascular access unit, um, it took me a lot of time in the beginning. So I think 45 minutes to one hour, it's not uncommon, especially when you're starting to do it your own. Um, but when you do it a lot, you get used to it and everything goes quicker, but you will overcome those problems, but you have to do it a lot yourself and then uh, you'll see um, how everything goes. Also plan the long term when you have to make your decision for an access, what is your second choice or your third choice? It's very important to have always in mind, what will I do next if this fails? And don't forget the, the follow-up. Okay, are there any questions? Okay. Okay. The sound is good. <laughs> I will talk about the uh, vascular access creation especially for arteriovenous fistula. And the problem or today you have a, you should have a plan for your patient. And you see this from the Kadoki guidelines. They have made a very nice flow chart to demonstrate that you need this plan, the investigation at the beginning, and then the choice of what you do as first and also have in mind what would be the next step to do in case of a problem. For instance, here you have the situation of a patient uh, starting dialysis. You have to check uh, the quality of the vessels, uh, if the life expectancy of the patient is important, and then you decide which kind of access you create, either a catheter, a graft, or even better, a navy fistula. So the decision when you should uh, create an access is depending on the uh, renal function. And if it's lower than 30 milliliter per minute per uh, 1.70 square meter, then you should think about the treatment and what are the options for the patient. And is this uh, rate going down less than 15? Then you should start to create an access. And of course, in case in this situation, you should preserve the veins and also to check that you avoid the uh, deterioration of uh, renal function. That was also already discussed a little bit before. You should check for the history of the patient. You should inspect the skin, scars, edema, the veins, then the check the vessels that you already heard. And sometimes it's also necessary, beside the duplex ultrasound, to have an additional imaging by MRI, especially if you suppose a central venous problem. The algorithm is... Uh, Summarized here in this uh, picture, vein preservation, clinical examination, physical examinations, duplex ultrasound, and then you can make your plan what's best uh, for the patient. We heard this uh, talk already from uh, Jan, just to see that we have a lot of variations, especially in veins in the area of the uh, cubital uh, uh, area. There are some uh, guidelines for taking decisions. One is that you should create it uh, in time. First look for AV fistulas, then uh, uh, yeah, the implantation of... Uh, where is this? 
is uh, if we are not uh, able to have an AV fistula or graft, or if the life expectancy is very short, and the rule non-dominant arm and uh, the lower extremity is really a rare uh, recommendation. Use of antibiotics, we have different guidelines, different answers. We in our practice do a prophylactic uh, antibiotic prophylaxis, but uh, you see the uh, level of evidence is relatively low. Heparin, the same question, no recommendation, low evidence, low quality. So it's on discussion. We normally use just 2,000 of uh, international uh, units of heparin, not more. And we have had less uh, complication for bleeding in uh, this case. Then some points to practical aspects. Uh, we normally operate with uh, plexus anesthesia because then you have a nice uh, vasodilatation. Sometimes you are surprised that suddenly you see the veins which uh, you couldn't see in advance. And the other thing is you can use a tourniquet during the operation to avoid clamping of the artery. Soft handling of the tissue is key, non-touch technique and the technique, how you perform the anastomosis, we will do that uh, uh, and demonstrate tomorrow how we use normally a parachute uh, technique. And using a punch, you can round a little bit the edges of the arteriotomy so that you have a very nice and open uh, anastomosis. And of course, you check after the surgery by flow measurement, the result of your anastomosis. That's our technique. We propose to do it in a parachute so that you start on, oops, sorry, uh, this one, so that you see all the time what you are doing, especially in this area of the heel of the anastomosis and also in this area. So you end up finally in the middle where you are nothing. That's the technique and it's very convenient to do that always in the same manner so you get uh, quicker and quicker. What we have as options, one is the snoof box AV fistula. As you see and already heard, for women it's not an ideal uh, construction because the vessel is um, too small. Otherwise, in men, it's very nice because it's closed. The vein is on the top of the artery. It's easy to do, and you can have very nice uh, results. In this case, we use a tourniquet just to avoid clamping of this in uh, artery. That's the advantage using a tourniquet. The patency uh, seems to be better. Uh, than just clamping. The radiocephalic fistula, you all uh, know about this uh, technique. As you see, the problem is non-maturation. It differs quite uh, large, the results from 5 to 46% uh, of primary non-maturation. So that's the problem uh, of creating uh, radiocephalic AV fistulas. As you know here, it's the ideal configuration is a uh, rectangular uh, positioning of the vein. And if you do it uh, more in a, in a sharp angle, you should have at least an incision of 10 millimeter length to have a nice uh, anastomosis and wide anastomosis. And you see here in this study, that the more perpendicular you have the anastomosis, the less you have uh, turbulences. So the risk for uh, myointimal hyperplasia is lower. And this is not easy to perform in the case. There is a, exp uh, an experience of uh, 
Klaus Conner, who has performed a lot of AV fistulas, he, uh, he said that you should have a length and an uh, arteriotomy in case of a sharp angle, and the incision could be a little bit uh, shorter in case of a more perpendicular uh, positioning of the vein. And you should out, uh, turn out a little bit the vein to avoid his uh, twist in this area because the plane of the vein is not the same if you bring it from the lateral side to the more medial uh, part of the artery. That was the reason why they are other proposition to create uh, anastomosis. I will pass just quickly so that you show that you can see what are in uh, under investigation. One is the slot technique that you don't use the end of the anastomosis of the vein, but the side so that you have a package on the top so that you have not this twist of uh, the vein when you bring this uh, towards the artery. The results seem to be better, but there are no other uh, uh, studies to show that this technique is really uh, better than the conventional one. The radar technique is also under discussion at the moment. In this case, you bring the artery to the vein and uh, we will see if these results are really better. But I didn't saw other um, um, studies to show that this technique is uh, to prefer. Another option is that uh, you bring it just close uh, to the vein. That's the same technique, not end uh, to end, but uh, side to side. And also here, they suggest that this is better than uh, the conventional technique. And the last one is that you don't forget to check for the basilic vein in the forearm. This is quite a nice uh, vein because it's not needled for uh, blood samplings. And sometimes you have a very nice basilic vein and you can transpose it if the cephalic vein is already damaged by uh, earlier puncturing. We use then, uh, we prepare the vein with uh, two separate incision. We expand it with a heparin solution to see the size and the tortuosity. Then we make the new tunneling we check again the outflow, and then we create uh, the fistula. Brachiocephalic AV fistula, here you should have an ideal incision. You check whether you go more for the cephalic or for the basidic vein, and we prefer an S-shaped incision so that we can extend in case to be uh, uh, more flexible than just making uh, a perpendicular incision. The other thing is that you can avoid to destroy, uh, damage the lymphatic vessels. And especially for radio uh, brachiocephalic fistula, you should have a smaller uh, arteriotomy that you can avoid high flow uh, fistulas. And the Graz fistula is a special kind of fistula where you use this perforator vein as an inflow vessel. Here this vein, and uh, you can use this uh, as a, for the anastomosis. Sometimes if you have a risk for uh, hand ischemia, you are not sure diabetic patient that the runoff is uh, good, you can also not use the brachial artery as inflow vessel, but go directly either to the radial artery or the ulnar artery, depending of which artery is better for the forearm. So if the radial artery is better for the hand, you go to the ulnar artery. So you can preserve the inflow for the hand with the better vessel uh, on the elbow. That's this uh, 
proximal radial artery based AV fistula, the so called Graz fistula with good results. And this was also the reason uh, why they started to create uh, percutaneous AV fistula using this uh, perforator vein. And today we have two possibilities with uh, endovenous uh, access creation. One is the wavelength system, one is this uh, ellipsis. Using this perforator vein, you can have a training. And as you see here, the wavelength system uh, goes from the vein and the artery. It uh, fixes the deep uh, vein to the artery, and you should close the deep vein that you have flow more to the superficial part uh, of the veins. And this is the advantage of using ellipsis. You go retrograde by the vein, you check for the deep vein, and then you perforate here, and you bring this device together, you give, applicate heat, and you can create an inflow to these perforator veins, which goes directly to the more superficial vein. I think these uh, results are quite uh, good if you have a good uh, selection of the patient. And as you see here, most uh, results are better for ellipsis. The selection is different. And uh, I personally be convinced that uh, ellipsis will uh, be the treatment for endovenous uh, better than wavelink. Other possible, yeah? How do you know if the flow will go selectively, selectively to the basilic or to the cephalic? Yeah, they go on both sides. You don't know because normally if you have the perforator vein, it splits to the both vein. But most of the time, if the uh, anastomosis is big enough, you have enough flow for dialysis for the cephalic vein. And for the basilic, if you have to use this, you have to make a transposition uh, by the time. So you can't use it uh, immediately because we have nerve around the basilic vein. So the basilic vein, as I said, the problem is that we have uh, nerves around this vein and you can't just bring it up because it's like a net sometimes. So you don't can't uh, bring it up. And we do that uh, mostly in one step. That's the discussion. Should you fer do first the anastomosis and then uh, the transposition or in the same uh, step? As you see here, uh, the superficialization is not easy to do because uh, the nerves are around, so you have to transpose the, the vein in this area. And uh, the recommendations uh, uh, are not absolutely clear. It depends a little bit from the situation. If you have enough time to do it in the second step, uh, if the vein is small, I prefer to wait just to uh, for the remodeling of the vein before we do the transposition. Postoperatively antiplatelet therapy, it's also under discussion. The recommendations are different. So most uh, don't give only aspirin, not the uh, anticoagulation. And in summary, there are some rules that you should have in mind. A good rehydration of the patient. And if you have a problem after uh, surgery, if the patient has pain after access surgery, something is wrong. So you have to check either it's a bleeding or it's a, a nerve damage or this. Uh, so you have to check immediately. Careful planning, soft uh, tissue handling, and uh, you have to check uh, your fistula over time and we should do this with a plan in mind if what could be the next step after access uh, creation so thank you thank you
Beyond Tunnel. Hallo? Ja. Klopt dat? Ja. Oké. Okay. So, a lot of theory. So I was thinking to let you work also a little bit. That's why you're here. So my talk about graphs, um, I first will start with the indications to put a graph. So maybe you can say what should be, or what could be an indication in a patient to put a graph. If the veins aren't cancer. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking you would say this. Very good. So if you do the duplex ultrasound, you see there are no good superficial veins to use um, uh, to make a fistula. So then you have to look for another option. And of course, there is a catheter, but we like to have also other options. This, so then there is a graft. So imagine you have a female patient, one meter 65. She's not very tall. She's fat. And she has this mapping. So no veins in the forearm. She has no cephalic vein in the upper arm that can be used because there is no cephalic arch and it's a bit sclerotic. But you have a nice basilic vein. And the length of the basilic vein that's useful is maybe 9 or 10 centimeters. So tell me, what will you do? I know it's a difficult question, but you have to imagine one day you wrote there on your own, in your own practice, and you need to make a decision. So it's important to know that there is not a bad decision. There is no good or wrong in this patient, I think, because you have the options of doing... What can you do? You can try to make break your basilic vein with a transposition. Or you can go that. Or maybe you can use a graft. Always think, it's what Professor Whitmer say, that you have this posterior basilic that sometimes is very useful, but it's not in this patient. So if you need to make the decision yourself, what will you do? It's just important that you think about it and that you think what could be the advantage to do a graft in this patient. And where will you start then? So if you do a transposition, you make an anastomosis in the elbow. If you do a graft, you need to have an outflow vein. So it's not starting. It doesn't get any better. So if you do a graft, you don't get away from maturation. Yes, that's a good point. Maybe you win some time. Other options why graft might be better. It's more superficial if she's really fat. Yes. <laughs> Something else. So you know you need like 10 centimeters to have a good cannulation. Often you see when patients are small and you have to transpose it, that can be difficult to have enough length. Maybe it will be a difficult cannulation. So I'm not saying in this patient you should do graft. I think if you can use a vein, you should use a vein. But it's just important that you know to learn to think about the options and why do you choose one option, why do you choose another options. And it's something that you can also discuss with your patients because your patients will give you input also about what they want. Some patients are really afraid about needling. So you can do a graft if there is no vein. Possible advantages of a graft, you have shorter maturation periods. You can use them uh, faster. Um, there is more length for cannulation. If it's a short vein that you can use, a graft, you have more length. And it can, you can put it really nice superficial. So sometimes puncturing a graft is more easy than puncturing a vein. Um, and another option, which you should not forget, is if you make a fistula and you have a long maturation time, sometimes people end up with catheters. Um, 
And it can be very difficult when people have catheters to convince them, if they have a fistula that it's not really wow, to convince them to start puncturing a fistula because it can be difficult, it can hurt. And some patients tell us, I have this catheter, I want to stay with the catheter. So avoiding a catheter by placing a graft can also be an advantage of putting a graft. So the types of graft, we all know the Gore-Tex graft from our um, peripheral vascular surgery, and we also know the PTFV grafts. Um, nowadays we use EPTFV, it's more flexible than the classic PTFV. And of course there are the early cannulation grafts. Um, what's the difference between an early cannulation graft and the grafts we know for peripheral bypasses in vascular surgery? It's that's a three-layer graft. So you have a special layer which allows sealing after puncturing and which allows also repeated puncturing. There are several early cannulation grafts. Um, you have the Accuseal, it's from Gore, Flixene from Getenge. We had the Vectra, but it's no more used as an early cannulation graft. Um, and you have the AV flow. I always, I myself, I use Flixene because uh, I like to use it. It's, in, it's protected with the plastic for the tunneling and it also has its own tunneler set you can use. Um, but of course you can use what you want. The early cannulation graft, because of the layers, you don't need the ingrowth of the graft. Normally the graft has, um, um, you need to, to let it grow in to prevent bleeding after puncturing. So normally we wait two weeks for puncturing a normal graft. The early cannulation graft, you can puncture it one or two days after the operation already. So that's the advantage. Um, we also have tapered grafts, so grafts which are proximal, smaller in diameter than distal. It is told that you can use these grafts to prevent ischemia but there is no clear evidence that it's better. So you can use it if you want, but it's not necessary. I never, I hardly ever use it. Um, configurations of the graft, there are a lot of different configurations. Of course, you can use a graft in the forearm, the upper arm, and you can make a straight graft or you can make a loop graft. Different configurations, a lot of studies about it. Um, I think in the end, um, I know a lot of access surgeons like more the Luftkraft. If you see in literature, it's not clear that it's better, but they say, the experts, that a Luftkraft is better to, uh, has better patencies than a straight graft. Um, most important for you, if you want to choose um, where do I put my graft or which configuration do I make? I think you have to be careful about the outflow vein because the main problem with grafts is that you have stenosis at the anastomotic side of the outflow vein, that you have scarring of the outflow vein. So it's not very important to make a cho to choose between straight or loop graft, but just choose a good vein. And I, I always take a vein which is at least four millimeters in diameter. And I make also a big anastomosis, at least two centimeters, um, to try to prevent venous outflow stenosis. But if you do grafts, you will see it. Um, you cannot really avoid it. What about loop and straight grafts? Um, this was what Professor Tordoir also told us. I don't really like operating in the axilla um, because there are a lot of nerves there. So you know the artery is behind or underneath the nerve. If you make a loop graft, you have to imagine that um, you cannot really place the leg like this because they won't like to puncture it because there are vessels and nerves underneath it. So the loop needs to go a bit this way. And then you have the nerve that can be compressed and also you have the muscles here. You have to go over the muscles. So um, the loop graft in the upper arm is very nice, but when you start doing it, it's not the most easiest, easiest operation, I think, because you have to be really careful. Where do I place the anastomosis? How do I place the loop? They don't like to puncture and curve, so you need some straight line um, for the nurses uh, to puncture. 
Um, and this is the publication of Professor Tordar. It's a nice publication because when you put in loops in the axilla, you will have patients with pain. Um, so it's very nice to read and to know that this, pa that this problem exists and that you try to avoid it as much as possible when you make anastomosis um, in the axilla. Um, so for me, this is my preferred graft, if it's possible. It's the uh, loop graft in the forearm. It's really easy to make because it's all superficial. You have a lot of place in the forearm and patients hardly ever complain of pain. Um, of course, when you make the loop graft, it's like you said, um, try to save options for the futures because what's not uh, on this uh, drawing, but what I also like to do sometimes is a straight graft in the forearm, where I go from the brachial artery, um, a straight graft in the upper arm, sorry, where I start from the brachial artery and I go up to the subclavian vein. Um, the nurses also like it very much because then you have a long straight graft, which is very easy to puncture and you cross the shoulder, but it's never a problem. Um, we don't see stenosis because of that. And we, as vascular surgeons, we are used to take the subclavian region also if you do fevers or if you make uh, axillofemoral bypasses, so it's not so difficult. But of course, um, when you start going to the subclavian vein, um, it's already some of the last options. So um, that's a disadvantage of this kind of uh, graft. So for anatomy, really important is that you evaluate your deep vein that you're using or your basilic vein. It should be big enough. There are no clear recommendations about it, but I take more than four millimeters. Of course, the artery, it's a bit the same, like in a fistula, you should have a good artery. If I do a graft, I also try to make the anastomosis of the artery not too big. If it's on the brachial artery, it's just five millimeters um, to prevent steel. And what about the tunneling? Of course, it's a, it should be superficial. We like to have two or three millimeters of tissue above the graft. Um, can you cross uh, an elbow or a shoulder? I think you can. Sometimes I cross the elbow to go a bit higher here on the basilic vein, but it's only if there are no other good options. Um, and of course, you have to make sure that your graft is well positioned so that they can uh, make a good puncturing of your graft. Um, what about the postoperative outcomes? Um, I always use the Flixen and the, the early cannulation graft, but what you see immediately after the operation is that surrounding the graft there is some edema. It even can be a bit red and warm. It can look like some erysipelas. Um, so early cannulation is not always possible because of the pain. It's painful for patients when it's swollen and red to do the cannulation. So if um, if I have to put in a graft, I try to do it two weeks before they start on dialysis so that if there is edema, um, that there is no problem with cannulation. And of course, then is the question, should you use an early cannulation graft and yes or not? So what about the patency of grafts? I come back to you. What do you think? What's the primary one-year patency rate of a graft? Uh, I think... 80% or so, still old to you. Eight? 80. 80. Okay, what do you think? The same. 67. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? 40. <laughs> yeah. And the secondary patency rate. So we have 40, 80, the secondary patency rate. Yeah. Next question. 30. Yeah. Oh, the <laughs> secondary patency rate is less than the primary. That's not possible. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. So it's uh, it's 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 bad for grafts in uh, in AV access. The patency rates of graft it's bad. So primary patency here is uh, is the blue line. So you see it going down in one year. Primary patency rate is almost forty percent. Of course, he's professor. He knows. And then. Um, the secondary patency rate you see in one year, it's 70%, but in two years, you see you have 
50, 60% secondary patency rate. So it means if you have a patient, you put in a graph that one on two of your patients will not be using their graft anymore for dialysis after two years. So um, it can be better, I'll, but it's, it's, um, it's not good. Um, so how can we prevent that these grafts are lost? And that's always a big discussion because this is about surveillance. There is a lot of discussion about surveillance in fistula and in grafts and even guidelines are not, um, are not telling the same. So if you look to the Kadoki guidelines, they say that there should not be routine monitoring of grafts. Other European guidelines, surgical guidelines say you can do it every three months. So in our practice, um, we do it twice a year. So every six months um, we follow up our grafts, especially to, to look to the venous outflow and the venous anastomosis. Um, main rule is that you uh, that we only do uh, interventions, so PTAs, if we have problems with dialysis. But if I have patients who, for some reasons, are not under dialysis and I have a severe stenosis, then I, I treat it also. And if they are on dialysis, um, we strictly follow up the stenosis if, if we see them, but normally we only intervene when there are some problems with dialysis. But the problem is when they are on dialysis and the nurses are doing the dialysis, it takes some time until they call the surgeon because you have some prolonged breathing and then it takes some weeks until they say, oh, now it's very long. So um, if you do this follow-up, Sometimes you say, oh, I see a stenosis, it, it does not look fine. And you ask the nurse, how is it going? Then she says, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, the last weeks he has, uh, he has prolonged breathing or we have sometimes problems with higher venous pressure. So um, that's why we do it every six months and we try in this way to prevent thrombosis of the graft. Um, so another problem is infection. We always tell patients we like more to use uh, veins than grafts because there is also a risk of infection. So, uh -huh. there is also somebody there. What do you think? What's the risk of infection? How many percent? 20? 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. Compared to United States, States to Europe. Oh, yeah, that's a good 50% infection over 10 in it's Europe, European. European, 2 to 5% infection. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, uh, it's 9 in this review, but yeah, 2 to 5, I think it's okay. So we see more problems with graft because of thrombosis and stenosis than because of, uh, of infection. Um, so what's the conclusion? I think if you want to put in a graft, really pay attention to the vein. Also, when you're doing the operation, make a big anastomosis. Be sure that you have a good vein with a good outflow. Should you use an early cannulation graft, you can choose. Um, and um, we do a follow-up to look for the venous outflow and the venous stenosis. Any questions? Yeah. Venous vein never used uh, if you don't have a suitable venous vessel. Yeah, uh, I sometimes used it. I did. Um, you see that that's what what I all also that they also told me when I was in education that you see more often fibrosis and stenosis that it's not made for puncturing. Uh, I use it for interpositions. I've used it in the leg with children when I just take the, but um, it's quite invasive to make, uh, to make, for example, a loop graft and it's very difficult to, to tunnel it in a loop. So because of the kinking, so maybe you can use it for a straight graft, but I don't know if there are any results about that, but I think you have a risk of, of becoming a fibrotic, sclerotic, and having difficulties after some time for puncturing. And then you have to take it out in the leg, and a lot of people don't like you to go to the arm and to the leg, so we don't do it. 
we we did it years ago. Seven Spain and even Seven Spain in the, in the uh, in the leg that was typical popular to do. But just what you said, you get uh, segmental stenosis over the whole length. And what you do now, then in infected area, you can use seven vein or a biological graft, eh, what uh, Wieker has done. And uh, we go to do this tomorrow for the whole procedure. No, no, not no. with seven vein because we're not going to do the leg. No. But if you do a drill procedure, you have a bypass to your forearm. This is a low flow circuit if you use a prostate graft to both in hours. So for a drill procedure, you use seven frame on the leg to do the bypass to the forearm. Of course, it is probably 100 cc per minute that goes through it. But uh, yeah, just what you said, you have to take seven yeah. frame out. It is, I have done this on the low core, but it is crazy. And uh, usually you have to do a general anesthesia, all these kind of things. So I think nobody's using seven frame as a primary option for uh, for an arm access nowadays. You don't see any publication on that, but no. it was... 30 years ago, it was very popular, this, this way. But I've done some like fish and children with Safinis, and that works well. But of course, it's children is very different. And we did also Rudy. So when you use the vein to make a longer fistula in case of high flow, it's also more easy to make the anastomosis on the radial artery because with prothesis, it can... Uh, but when you really puncture it here in the upper arm, you have stenosis and it becomes sclerotic. I have just a comment because infection and grafts, I think it's a technical issue how you do that. One is the ideal positioning of the incisions, that these are not on the top of the anastomosis. Mm -hmm. Then the soft uh, handling of the tissue, if you use a tunnel, you have only a small space to bring the graft in and the non-touch technique with hands and that's good with the flexene you have a sleeve over yeah. the graft and it's not in contact to the mm. skin so you place it uh, protected uh, under the uh, mm. skin and that's an advantage and i think it's important that you have a excellent technique uh, putting grafts in and in the states they put it in 20 minutes and sometimes it's not so uh, yeah. carefully This is also infection rates because of puncturing of dialysis. We don't see it often. The infections I see with ore grafts is when we had to do like a thrombectomy and it's done um, uh, in the weekend and then they make an incision over the graft and then you have a problem. Then it starts infecting. So even if you do a thrombectomy, it's, it's never good to make an incision over a fistula because for puncturing, they don't like puncturing in scars. So you always have to put your incisions aside that you have normal skin and, in, and certainly in grafts to prevent infection that wounds are away from the graft. It's a very good remark. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you about surveillance. I think there the vasculitis team can help a lot. For example, what I did was every two weeks, I took one group of patients, like mm -hmm. the Monday, Wednesday, Friday group, and the other, and then you, you just have a look at patient files, bleeding time, cannulation issues, yeah. and so on. And then you can go to the surgeon every two weeks and say, mm -hmm. these are probably problems. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because this is what we also wanted to do in our service, that we had some kind of routine clinical follow-up of patients. But as a surgeon, it's very difficult some, to manage it because you have three groups of patients. You have the morning group and you have the group in the afternoon also, which makes six groups. Um, so uh, yeah, it's sometimes difficult to have the time to do this routine clinical follow-up. So if you can pay a nurse and you have somebody who wants to do it, I think it's very useful, but of course it's all organization and logistics. Okay, thank you very much, Arnie. Yep. And nowadays, uh, there's more interest to put in catheters, and in the Netherlands is now a study going on uh, comparing catheters to grafts to a fish as a certain uh, old age group. Now, catheters, it is easy. You can uh, put it in. Uh, you can use it immediately. 
Of course, you have some problem with it, infection from both, and even you can die from sepsis. And um, yeah, if you put in cat, uh, you know that it will not last for for years. I think so. Of course, you don't have any steel. Um, um, if you have to uh, do this, always use ultrasound. We're going to do this uh, this afternoon. Uh, ultrasound uh, guidance. We don't have uh, radiology guidance. Um, but of course, uh, I think in the hospital, we should also have a uh, CE arm to, to look where it goes. <laughs> it doesn't go to the other side. Um, indications, now this is what you can find. Um, usage is kind of bridging to functioning of a permanent uh, access, uh, uh, non maturation of AVF or the graft, you cannot use the graft. Or the patients have been um, waiting on the waiting list for a transplant. This is a good indication. Um, if they have a donor, you usually say take the family with uh, there to the polyclinics and say, this is my donor. In three months, uh, I, I will get this. So you can put in the catheter to bridge to transplant. That is really good. Um, and of course, you have complications of permanent access. Sometimes you have put in catheter because you cannot plan the operation or you have to uh, bridge uh, the time uh, till the complications are over. And of course, um, very old patients, maybe it's better to put in a catheter, not to wait for four or six months <laughs> for maturation. Um, so they need flow. Um, and usually they, they phone you, we don't have flow, and then you, you, you get all the troubles. Uh, so you have to put the patient on the, on the head uh, to reverse lines, just to get flow uh, over 250. And this is also a kind of uh, looking at the adequacy of the of the, the usage and to see if the, your the other treatment is adequate. Um, don't remove the catheter every <laughs> week or <laughs> put in another one. And of course, we like internal jugular uh, catheters and try to get the infection risk low. Usually, it's not your fault that you get infection, but the handling of the catheter in the dialysis ward sometimes is not so very good then. If they have a very good bundle of steps to, to handle the catheter, your infection rate goes down. This is what you find. Um, in the Netherlands, this one is usually used. This is from meneer, uh, Mr. Steve Ersi. He's now a millionaire because he developed a split catheter. This is from Mr. Michael Tal. He's a millionaire because he developed this catheter with the symmetrical tip. But it's true or not? No. But we are not millionaire because we are not so clever. Um, <laughs> and this is Mr. Tejo, but this is a very old one. He died as millionaire, I think so. Half millionaire. <laughs> Two characters, but this, you have to puncture twice the jugular vein. So, but in the middle, uh, I think the most of uh, you uh, use it. You can see the tips split, stepped. And symmetrical tips, it doesn't matter so much uh, how it works, but most of the catheters are the same. Um, we're going to do the tunneled catheter this afternoon in the Turkey. Uh, that means that you have to tunnel it. Uh, that is always uh, a little bit more difficult as an untunneled catheter. And what is the advantage of a tunneled catheter? That uh, probably it gives less infection. And it is uh, fixed by this decron cuff. So there's ingrow of um, subcutaneous tissue in the cuff that it gives some barrier to infection, but also to <laughs> prevent falling out. <laughs> but uh, be careful. I have seen all happening, all cat catheters that has been removed by the patient, even PD catheters removed by the patient. All is possible. So you have to fix the catheter very tightly, otherwise it is gone. Um, this is usually ingrow in three weeks. Some patients never has ingrow. And there you see all this uh, kind of, of fancy ends, openings. And what you do doesn't matter. All the catheters perform the same. This is where it should go. So it should be below the, uh, the uh, cave or atrial uh, area. Uh, and, and it should be really in the in the right atrium. Um, 
we're going to talk about internal nuclear uh, thing, catalysts, but of course, if these are obstructed, you can go to all kinds of other locations, uh, the groin, but the groin is not so clean. And even you can ask the, the rheologist to put in the cat in the in the inferior cave of the vein or through the liver in the vein, but that is of course not so nice. Um, this afternoon we're doing the technique of undergrade uh, cat insertion. We're going to use the ultrasound. And uh, I always did a drawing of the sternocleinum uh, mustavit muscle, the kind of, kind of triangle, the long segment of the muscle, the short segment, and the uh, clavicle. And then you get this kind of triangle. And here, probably, you put um, the catheter or your needle in two centimeters um, uh, proximal of the clavicle. The, the needle in the interjucular vein um, to the direction of the nipple. Again, you see it here. And then if the needle is in, you put in the guide wire and then you tunnel. Um, if you do an undergrade uh, insertion, you tunnel first the catheter and then you put in over the guide wire your POV sheet. This is really a huge apparatus and put in the catheter through the POV sheet. Um, this is dangerous <laughs> movement. You can really um, murder the patient with this kind of uh, huge uh, apparatus. And if you do this from the left side, it's even more dangerous because you have to pass a curve in the vein. This is the red, red great uh, insertion. We're not going to do this, but I will uh, say that. So what you do is you start with uh, uh, putting in the, the, the catheter and then you're going to um, tunnel it to from uh, proximal to distal. This re retrograde through the chest. Um, that means you have to connect the different pieces to the catheter. So it is it's in the undergrade technique we first tunnel, in the eradicate technique we first put in the catheter, then it's going in a tunnel backwards to the chest. But then you need some connection uh, pieces to, uh, to uh, complete the, the whole catheter. But we're not going to do this today. But in certain indications, sometimes it's needed to do this uh, to make a good functioning of a catheter. This again, um, the uh, indication therefore is you can better position the catheter tip because if you start with an undergrade technique, you already have um, determined where your tip comes. If you do a retrocatization, you can put it in the tip and the fluoroscopy on the right. Uh, position, and then you go back to tunnel it. This, that is really the difference between undergrade and, and, and retrograde tunneling. This is a kind of an algorithm if you do a catheter insertion, and always know that don't proceed if you're not sure. Don't do this. You can kill the patient. I, I, I've seen this happening, and that because they put in the the get it in the cortical artery or it came through the cable vein in the thoracic cavity and patient died. Just don't proceed if you don't know what to do. So you should have back bleeding uh, from your needle. Check if you have venous blood. I, I've myself had, I thought I'm in the artery because the, the, the blood is so red, uh, I, but the, the patient was so oxygenated that it was in the vein. But I didn't proceed with the, with the procedure because I was not sure for this. And uh, so you have all to do the, all these steps. And um, if you're sure, you can go and do uh, put in the POV sheet uh, and uh, place the catheter. If you cannot proceed and you need a catheter, if you really are totally desperate, then of course you can open it up. But most of you are not going to do this probably, but 
course, if it, you, you need an approach and you cannot see it, and, uh, then you can make a small incision and do an open insertion. It is possible. The problems are, of course, cattle obstruction. Uh, usually you get thrombus inside or outside. Usually outside, we call this a fibrin sheet. Uh, you can try to, to solve this with, uh, with heparin and cytoglock or thrombolyticum. Uh, most of the uh, dialysis units use urokinase or med medicinase in some patients to put in this at the end of the dialysis treatment. But I think urokinase is not available anymore. Or just but you can put it in as a thrombolyticum or um, you have patients with uh, hypercoagulability that you get all these problems, a malposition tip. You can have also kind of fiber sheet. Um, this is the problem we, we, we usually see in catheters, and that's the reason that it doesn't work anymore. Um, it's encased in a kind of layer of fiber. And the problem is if you take the catheter out and put it over the guide wire, Again, in you are again in the fiber sheet. It doesn't work. You have to go out the fiber sheet. It's not so easy to solve this problem. And you see that it is uh, really in, in a lot of patients that it uh, will uh, appear uh, after some time. This is how it looks like. And one of the other things is to try to stromalize is one of the things or uh, guide wire exchange. That is the problem that you get to get it in the same fiber sheet or uh, try to convince your radiologist, or you can do it yourself to do kind of uh, uh, percutaneous angioplastic of the fiber sheet. You can try it. Um, and sometimes, if you're really desperate and you don't know what to do, you can put in a snare and try to, to strip it. But the problem is that it's then in the lungs. And now I'm not sure what is better to get cloth in the lungs or don't have a catheter anymore. So the snare. Um, this is sheet dilatation, you can do this, uh, but I'm not sure if the, the results are very good. And um, mostly you end up with an, uh, not possible to, to put in uh, that side a new catheter. You have to go to the ground or to the other side or, or be uh, better, try to get a permanent access. Infection or the problem uh, just depends on the handling of the catheter usually. Uh, sometimes it's the insertion technique was not good. Um, so you can have this kind of redness in the exercise tunnel. Um, and then you can probably solve this with doing a new tunnel traject, but it's not so easy. You have to usually remove the catheter and make a new tunnel catheter, uh, traject with a new catheter. This is what is most departments uh, look for this is in the analysis obligatory to know your uh, CRBSI. You have to, to know this, so you have to count this. And if you are too high, uh, above four per thousand catheter days, you have to change your protocol. And nowadays, there's departments say they don't have any uh, CRBSI anymore because of they have a very good bundle of. Uh, uh, task I do in the uh, dialysis wards without any infection anymore. But of course, if you have this, this is a harmful problem and you can can lose your patient because of, of uh, sepsemia. Yeah? Do you determine if it's caused by the catheter? Do you do it with just a hemoculture? Or do you, 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 you have to draw blood from peripheral and from the catheter? Two, two things. Uh, again, now everyone looks of looks use citrate uh, with citrate locking solution. Then the instance is going down, and this is also been done. This is a kind of antibiotic downloading, but this is very expensive. There's nobody using this. I think some sense in, the, in Germany, and then it goes even more lower. So that is less as one per thousand uh, catheters. This is really good. And uh, here you can see this, this uh, was done um, um, with the removal due to infection. If you use citrate, local solution of the taurodine. So the taurodine are um, doing better as compared to citrate, but it's expensive. Then obstruction. Uh, this is, uh, the, the, I think, the, one of the, the largest issue with uh, um, long duration catheter dialysis. You get a high prevalence. 
if you had the catheter for some time. Um, we don't do any subclavian catheters, but we see more and more internal jugular vein obstructions and even lower in the brachiocephalic and uh, even cable vein. You see it more and more if uh, the left side has to do with the curves. Uh, the catheter is uh, close to the vessel wall. If you do the left side, uh, more damage to the vessel wall. Of course, you have lines, uh, previous lines you have to do any preoptive uh, phlebography uh, to rule out um, uh, obstruction. Um, and of course, if you have a lot of catheters in the past or infection in catheters, you have a higher uh, incidence of central vein obstruction. We will discuss this after the break, uh, but it is real an issue now because more and more patients using catheters nowadays. Um, there's a kind of uh, direction that we tend to put in primarily catheters in elderly patients nowadays, more and more. And if these patients live for three, four years still with the ice treatment, you can get this uh, problem because you have to get it inside. So this is nowadays more and more a problem than years ago, I think so. Okay, we will have a coffee break now for a uh, new half an hour. One or uh, what? 11.30, so we have to hurry now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay.